Hello, and welcome to another edition of ATL Prime Sports. I'm JJ Jurjevic. Joining me this evening is the one, the only, Wayne Ridenauer in Memphis, Tennessee, and our fabulous co-host this evening, Larry Gardner, the PA voice of the Rome professional baseball team, because I believe they're changing their name, right? Right, Larry? How you doing tonight, guys? <laughs> yeah, we're changing our name. We will find out the new name on the 16th. So there will be an official announcement made then. We're supposed to be at the stadium at 5 o'clock. So I guess I'll know at about 510, and then everybody else will know about 530, and we'll know <laughs> the new name of the Rome used to be Braves and the new name of the professional baseball club. But everything is well in our neck of the woods. JJ, thank you for asking, man. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Wayne, how you doing this evening, buddy? Well, I'm I'm doing pretty good, but um, I, I look forward to the Memphis playing uh, Michigan game, not just because I, it's a chance to, you know, play a big team, but uh, it'll be the return of Penny Hardaway. He's on a three-game suspension for the recruiting violations back in 2001, I think. And, uh, you know, we play play Missouri next and then Alabama State, and then he'll be back on the sidelines. There we go. Yeah, I'm doing pretty well, as well as the Los Angeles Angels' newest manager, Ron Washington, the former Braves third base coach, will get another shot as the manager at 71 years young, making him the oldest manager in Major League Baseball. Great hire for Los Angeles. Washington went, went, went uh, what, 664 and 611 as the Rangers manager yep. and had two American League pennants, as Wayne knows too well. Came up just short both times. But, uh, yeah, hats off to our third base coach, Ron Washington. The AL West, you might be seeing a lot of ass and yeah. elbows, as, as Ron Washington liked to say. Guys, you can find us all at ATL Prime Sports on Facebook, Twitter, or X. Instagram, YouTube, Apple, and Spotify. Our personals at JJ Get You One for myself at RWY Junior for Wayne at Porter Todd for TC Todd Porter, who is out tonight supervising some umpires, and at LG for Real Though for our very own Larry Gardner. What's on tap for tonight? We have Ethan Offit from the Dogs Daily, he joins the show talking about the big game this weekend and much more around the SEC. And we're going to do our pick six, short and sweet. There is a ton to talk about. I'd love to get into everything, but we got a little bit of a time issue this week. So without further ado, we welcome our guest. Dogs can clinch their spot in the SEC East Championship this weekend with the win over Ole Miss. Can they do it? We talk with Dogs Daily writer Ethan Offit. And find out, Ethan. Thanks for coming on. How you doing tonight, buddy? Hey guys, I'm doing good. I appreciate you guys having me on tonight. Uh, to touch on the Ole Miss Georgia game, it's going to be a tough game, I think, uh, for both both teams. Uh, primarily, I think more so defensive side of the ball for both teams. Uh, Ole Miss brings a lot offensively. I mean, it's everybody knows what Lane Kiffin can do with the offense. But just looking at it, I mean, Keenshawn Judkins, he, he's their main rusher, and he's hitting those B gaps on those outside zone runs and just gashing defenders that, who can't bring them down. And it's the same thing Missouri did against Georgia last week, and Auburn has done as well. Um, I, but the thing that I'm concerned for Ole Miss defensively is just the passing game of Georgia. Uh, they play a bunch of zone coverage out there. And sure, they're ranked top five nationally with sacks. They have 31 sacks on that defensive line. But I, with all that zone coverage, Carson Beck, I think, is just going to pick them apart with their with his accuracy and just be delivering the ball in timely decision manner. Yeah, it's a huge game this weekend. Uh, lots, lots of lots of keys to the game. Dogs Daily did a great job, folks. If you want to go check them out. Again, just search Dogs Daily on Twitter or Google it. Pop up all the articles. They do a great job over there breaking down everything Georgia Bulldogs. I'm excited to see what the, the storylines. I was really hoping Juice, the dog, was coming 
<laughs> from from Ole Miss over. We were going to have a dog fight, literally. Juice <laughs> yeah. first hug on the sidelines. But supposedly, Georgia won't let other live mascots on the sidelines. Fooey. So, anyway, that's no longer a storyline. But Lane versus Kirby is. And, man, what a big win for this for, for Ole Miss if Lane were able to pull this one off, Ethan, huh? Yeah, I mean, it would really cement them – as like a contender in the SEC West. I mean, they've always been on the brinks of being a contender right there with LSU and Alabama, but they haven't been able to get over that hump yet. And I mean, again, this year they didn't, I don't, yeah, they lost to Alabama, but they beat LSU, which is a right step in the direction, but they're coming into a tough environment. Uh, something they're comfortable with in the SEC West, nonetheless. But I just think Georgia's a more complete team that they'll face this year. Um, but if they were to pick up a win, it would be a big boost in recruiting trail, the rankings, and obviously I think it would pick up the SEC West too. All right. I think I think uh, we, we might uh, we may have lost Larry. Larry, you still there? No, I'm still here. There we go. Go ahead, man. Yeah, no. So Ethan, Larry Gardner here. Question for you. So we look at what Georgia's been able to do, and everybody's comparing them to the two national championship teams. The one thing I was looking at when it comes to, to the Ole Miss squad, basically offensively, is they've had such a hard time converting third downs, man, against any any tough defensive opponents. I think they were like 3 or 14 or 15 against Alabama. You know, it's really unfair to compare this Georgia defense to the prior two. But what do you see in the defense of the Georgia Bulldogs this year that gives them the heads up or, or even gives them the, 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 the lack of a better term, no pun intended, the dog, to keep fighting as hard as they keep fighting that week in and week out? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I agree with you. I don't think you can compare this team to either of the previous two national championship teams just because of how different, how many pieces they've had to replace from those two teams. Uh, but to answer your question, though, I think the part on that defense that keeps them, keeps that dog in them is the secondary and Fran, what Fran Brown has been able to do with them. Uh, Tyke Smith Lee is tops in the country in interceptions. I believe he has five to this point in the season. But what I noticed in this last game against Missouri was that Kamari Lasseter was essentially lined up against Lou in the entire game. Uh, he, Fran Brown, according to us, my sources, he went to Glenn Schumann and was wanting that matchup for Lasseter to be on burden the entire game. I think that having that trust in your secondary, which has probably been the best secondary you've had in the past three years, is a key thing, and it also allows your pass rushers to get some confidence in themselves. You're listening to Ethan Offit right here on ATL Prime Sports. You can find Ethan on X, formerly known as Twitter. I still like to call it the old Twitter. At Ethan Offit, that's O F F U T T 84. That's E T H A N O F F U T T 84. You can find him on X and Twitter and at Dogs Daily. Go read his articles, check him out. Great stuff there. I want to talk about your three key players for Ole Miss, your article you wrote a couple of days ago. Uh, you you kind of touched on it earlier. Let's get a little bit more in depth on the on the three beasts of, of Lane Kiffin's offense over there. But Jackson Dart leads a, a great offense, and when they're spreading that rock around, Ethan, it looks pretty good. And it, it's it's a night and day difference, though, from home and on the road in this difference. And your thoughts on that? Yeah. Um... So to touch on the home and road aspect of it real quick, uh, I, th I don't think the road environment for Ole Miss will be as much of a factor just because they do play in the SEC West. Uh, they had to go to LSU and play that game there. They just came off of a tough victory in Texas a at Texas A&M, which Texas A&M played very well defensively in that game, I believe. 
Um, but they also played, I think they played at Auburn this year. So they're tough to these tough, used to these tough environments, excuse me. Um, but the three key players offensively for Ole Miss, like you said, Jackson Dart, he's been playing exceptionally well this season, I believe. Uh, just some of his stats real quick. He has almost 2,500 passing yards for the season. And then he has 16 touchdowns and just four interceptions. I mean, he's completing the ball at a high rate and has led the Ole Miss offense to 12th in the country, averaging almost 40, 480 yards a game. Uh, they're playing at a high pace, and I think they're able to do that because of the RPO option that Lane Kiffin has rolled in there. And that opens up Keenshawn Jukins, who I mentioned earlier, their main rushing or running back. He has 793 yards for 22 touchdowns on the season, and he's just – he bursts through the gaps when he gets the ball. He's a tough guy to bring down when you cut on the tape. He just slips through the arm tackles of the SEC West defenders. I, um, Physical but runner, more, absolutely. Very tough runner. Um but I think Georgia, like I said, their secondary, the, that speed there in the secondary, they're able to get to the flats and contain that outside run like they did against Missouri. They, ever, or they gave up four yards a carry against Missouri, who usually gets about seven yards a carry with, that, uh, with the running back there. I think uh, Schrader, yep, I think Schrader. was his name. Yep, Schrader yeah, so, it up. I mean, just three, four yards at a clip, man. And uh, Bentley mm -hmm. and Judkins, they can do the same thing. Yeah, um, but more importantly, they Ole Miss has three wide receivers with over 600 yards. They're the only team in the country uh, with that capability. Um, they're the only team in the country with three receivers over 600 yards. The main guy has been uh, – Trey Harris, who just came off of the SEC Co-Offensive Player of the Week with 11 receptions and 213 yards against Texas A&M. Uh, they're very versatile, which is scary. Um, for It's scary for any team. But I think with Georgia, their, their eyes are very well maintained defensively that they'll be able to stay calm and not get mixed up in that RPO or just all that craziness in Lane Kiffin offense and shut it down. Again, you're listening to Ethan Offit right here on ATL Prime Sports. Ethan, told me earlier, you got a Brock Bowers nugget. Let me hear it. Yeah, so <clears throat> some of my sources close to me, they've been hearing word that he's slowly been inching back and back to being, or let me start over, sorry. My sources close to me, they've been telling me that Brock Bowers, since the Florida game, his target has been to come back for Ole Miss. We heard yesterday from Marcus Rosemey Jack Saint that Brock Bowers is hitting on the radar gun, 19 miles per hour, 20 miles per hour. All right. What I heard today was that number 19 could be strapping up Saturday. It's a high likelihood he'll be back. Well, Ooh, fingers crossed, but high likelihood he could be back. Larry, well, you hear that one? I did hear that one. That leads me to a two-parter for the next one. <laughs> Ethan. Georgia should be yes, good sir. enough to win this game without him if he doesn't play. Why rush him back any sooner than need be? I, I think it's more of him wanting to be back. Honestly, if you look at it, Brock Bowers, we know he has the extra year, but honestly, he's not going to take that extra year. And this is more than likely the last time he'll ever be able to walk through and play a game between the hedges. So I think it's more Brock Bowers wanting to be back than it is Kirby Smart and uh, Mike Bobo wanting him to be back. Okay, and that leads me to part B of the same question. The one aspect that I've been really paying attention to, I'm not a Georgia fan, but I do pay attention to the Bulldogs. We've seen Kendall Milton, you know, really ratchet it up here the last couple of weeks, especially against Missouri when – when he came out to run, he really came out with everything just just almost like his hair was on fire, and he played like 
He played like a player with something to prove. What do you foresee for him as a, a key component to this Georgia offense moving forward? And what do you see long-term in how valuable he will continue to be to this Georgia Bulldog offense? You know, um, I think the weird thing for Kendall Milton this year was that coming into fall camp before he had his hamstring injury, he was expected to be the guy. Um, And if he was fully healthy, he expected to come in, get the running back one reps, and pretty much not be taken out. That's, That's at least what I was expecting. Um, But then he dealt with that hamstring injury, and we've seen Dejon Edwards burst onto the scene. And Edwards, in my opinion, is more of a complete NFL back now just because of the way he's been able to use his hands in the passing game and his elusiveness in the running game. He's very slippery. Um, But with Kendall Milton, as you mentioned, he's been turning on a different gear and it's it's looking like he was his sophomore year before he started dealing with the string of injuries. I think you could start to use these guys in more of a, ah, I don't want to say Nick Chubb and Sonny Michelle way because they're not those bruising running backs that Chubb and Michelle was, but you can use them in a similar way in the passing attack, I believe. And I think that'll pay prove dividends for Milton as far as his draft stock's concerned because the NFL offense is becoming passing based and you need to be able to catch the pass as a running back now. So listen to again Ethan off it right here on ATL Prime Sports. Larry, I think I cut you off. Go ahead, man. No, 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 you were good. You were good because the way and and he brought up my other key point to that is is are we going away from people really utilizing the dual, you know, thunder lightning attack that you see a lot of a lot of teams running in in in, in college football? Whereas in years past, you had the the bell cow back, and you mentioned Dejon Edwards, man, and he's, I mean, he, he when Milton went down, he took over, and and he just he he just continued to plow the way, you know, and it's a it's a good problem to have if you're Georgia because. You open the cupboard, you know, you, you think you're going to get a good plate and Brock Bowers goes down, plate's broken. But Mike Bobo, who a lot of Georgia fans were ready to light their torches and grab their pitchforks, he and Carson Beck, after after a few games, just started to build some continuity, you know. And one of the byproducts of that continuity has really been Dejon Edwards. And, and you talked about it a little bit, but Ethan, go ahead and finish talking about how, how special he's been so far for the dogs and how important he'll be going into the the latter half of the season in the playoff run. Yeah, uh, you know, when Milton did go down with that hamstring injury in camp, as I mentioned earlier, we we never we didn't know who was going to come in and be that guy for Georgia. It was Edwards. We saw Dylan Bell taking reps. People were saying Brock Bowers was going to move positions. I mean, there was a bunch of talk. But as you mentioned, Dejon Edwards has really came in and taken over that spot. Um, I I think they'll keep the way they've used them against Florida and Missouri. I mean, I I don't see anything broken with our running game and the way we use their running backs. It's not as lethal as it was it used to be, as you mentioned, as bruising as what it used to be. But I think that's just the way football's trending now. I mean, speaking at it, at it from a player's perspective, a bunch of these running backs, they don't want to be hit. They they just want to catch the ball and go score. So, I mean, you don't see Derrick Henry and Nick Chubb waltzing through the halls anymore like you used to. Well said. Ethan, you wrote an article about the college football playoffs and the recent rankings – You put Ohio State one in your prediction. You were correct on that. Is it right? Do you think uh, Georgia should be number one? What's your thoughts on that? I personally, I've said this. I said it last week. I I think each and every top five undefeated team right now has a legitimate argument to make for the number one team in the country. Washington's got a couple good wins uh, in the Pac-12 over, again, a uh, 
a great conference on the way out from top to bottom right now. You got the win over Oregon at home, albeit, but it's still a win over Oregon. And I tell you what, I, I, I agree with Georgia at two right now simply because of the schedule. But if they get this win this weekend, I think there's a flip-flop. Your thoughts on the college football playoff rankings and the possibility of that happening? Yeah, um, I think, like you said, right now, any team, I personally believe, through eight has, kind of has an argument to get into the playoffs. The The only reason I throw Bama in there, too, is because of how well they've played since that Texas lost. But we all know Texas is not going to go below Bama unless they just lose a string of games, and that's unexpected. Um I think with the college football playoffs, what everything's asked, what everybody is asking for is consistency, which you're just not going to get consistency because of how much things you can look at to rank a program. Uh, I think right now Ohio State being at one is debatable after this past weekend because we're saying Ohio State looking at the schedule, that's why they're number one. But Georgia as well has two ranked wins, just like Ohio State does. And if we're going to go based off of these rankings, these, this Notre Dame team, they haven't looked hot recently, just like Kentucky. Um, so I think there needs to be some consideration taken into that, as well as the fact that, as Kirk Herbstreit mentioned in the show last night, I believe Ryan Day would be able to come out and say his own team isn't the best team in the country right now. Uh, He said he doesn't have the best quarterback play in the country. So I think he would be willing to admit that as well. After this weekend, if Georgia does win, I think they do deserve the number one spot because they've come off of two straight ranked wins and they'll be going into their third one against a tough Tennessee team. Um, But I think really the spot for four is more wide open than what we think. I don't think Florida State should be undefeated. Uh, I think if Clemson didn't find a kicker off the sidewalks, they would have (laughs) won that game. Uh, And that I also think Duke, if Riley Leonard didn't go out that second half, they probably would have pulled away with that game. Um, So I think that four spots more wide open than what people think. You mentioned Washington and Oregon. the most competitive argument that will be for that four spot outside of Florida State um, just because of that head-to-head matchup that was in Seattle. Uh, I think think even if it's played in Oregon in Autzen Stadium, it's that close of a game, but I think Oregon does pull away with it. It's just, it's too close to say, Um, but I don't know. I Just like I said earlier, everybody's looking for consistency. I think if you just sit down and actually watch the teams play, you can put position by position who's the better team and who would win. Yeah, I, I like what Greg McElroy said last night on the uh, college football playoff release, uh, release rankings release show. I, you know, the, they said, okay, resume for number one over number two – but I test for three and four, resume for five and six. So they're going back and forth. I kind of wish they had a equation for this where they would say, all right, this is what we're looking for. Kind of like, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally that we all remember from, from middle school, you know. I wish they would go like, okay, uh, head-to-head first. Okay, they didn't play. All right, resume first, then I test. Or they're like, we're going I test first, then resume. You know, I wish there was there was kind of more consistency like everybody's been saying. Well, Ethan, that's about all the time we got, man. We're going to let you get. Before we go, uh, our, our producer wants to say bye. And obviously, tell our listeners how they can find you on Dogs Daily, my friend. Yeah, so uh, you can find me on X or Twitter, as mentioned earlier, at Ethan Offit84, and that would be at E T H A N O F F U T T 84. Or you could just Google my first and last name, Ethan Offit, and just put Dogs Daily after it, and all the articles will pull up. 
Uh, if you want to watch some film study, a good film study would be the Film Guy Network with my boss and Dogs Daily lead editor, Brooks Austin. It's a good good breakdown of Georgia and opponents that Georgia will face. All right. Well, listen, uh, Ethan, it's good having you on. I uh, understand you'll be graduating soon, so get that degree and uh, go do good things, man. Yes, sir. And I appreciate all the three of y'all having me on and taking the time to let me come and talk some dogs football with y'all. All right. You're welcome, man. And anytime, again, Ethan Offit from Dogs Daily. Thanks, Ethan. We'll talk to you next time, buddy. All right. You guys have a good one. All right. See you, man. All right, guys, we'll move on. We'll do our pick six. Again, short show. Lots to talk about. Um, guys, do a quick comment on Falcons right quick. Uh, huge debacle last week, losing to a player that just got off the, the plane, basically, in Josh Dobbs, Alpharetta High School native, hats off to the Vikings. They, they, they took it to the Falcons in the fourth quarter. But, guys, your quick thoughts on the Falcons, and then we'll go into the pick six because we're not talking about it today. Uh, Wayne, your, your thoughts first, man. Well, I'm, I'm wearing black today. Uh because of uh, how poorly the Falcons have done. But uh, I've got basketball to look forward to, so uh, I'm not all that hurt by it. <laughs> Larry, your thoughts, buddy? Oh, man. I'm going to wrap this up. I'm, I'm not going to be as long-winded as I could have. Here's the deal. There's no excuses. This is on one man. It's on Arthur Smith. There's no way in the world you should ever be an NFL professional football team with chances of score inside the five-yard line. And not one, not two, but three opportunities and come away with three field goals. Yeah. That is inexcusable. He needs an offensive coordinator. He was never that guy in Tennessee. I think he's a good leader of men. He just needs to let go of the play calling. He's not – I'll, I'll put it to you like this. As a Falcons fan my entire life, I've had PTSD since a kid. This is nothing new to me. Yeah, but, me neither, man. You know, so, but why why in the world are you going to have a, I'll, I'll use a Lamborghini souped up Ferrari type engine sitting in the in the garage, and all you're going to do is turtle wax it every other, every other day, and it's just going to yeah. sit there. You know, they have such electric, electric pieces to be able to use. There's no reason in the world you can't tell me that. And I'll give Drake running the pass because he was injured last week. There is no way in the world you can't tell me. I could even get, I could draw up a play that could get either Bijan Robinson, Kyle Pitts, or any other our, our talented, talented, talented skill players in the end zone, and within five yards, in three plays, guaranteed. I'm done. Falcons, you gotta win. If you lose to Arizona, I'm done. Yeah, well, so, so is, go. yeah, Arthur Smith would be done too. <laughs> yeah, you gotta it's, go. It's, they lose to Arizona, you gotta go. Yeah, it, it's it's unfortunate what's happened to the Atlanta Falcons. I think this team is a little bit more talented than their record showing. I also scratch my head on the use of Cordero Patterson, who led your team in rushing rushing touchdowns last year. Uh, he, he sent a cryptic tweet out, you know, uh, with a pretty physical run that he performed last year versus Tampa Bay, saying, "I do this ish," and uh, I, I think Cordero Patterson has a right to get the couple goal line touches as well as let's move on to our picks gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen if you'll please bear with us we're experiencing technical difficulties Bullshit! all right guys we had a little technical difficulties there sorry about that we lost larry's audio so we're just gonna plunge on forward with our pick six and uh here we go it's time for the ATL Prime Sports Pick 6. We pick six football games. Lines and spreads are from Monday per Caesar Sportsbook. This week, it's four college, two pro, and it's number three, Michigan, 9-0. and At number 10, Penn State, 8-1. and Michigan's three-and-a-half point favorites in this one. The 44-and-a-half is the over-under Saturday 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Fox. 
27th meeting between these two teams. Wayne, what say you? Man, I, I feel like I can hear that, that song, Zombie Nation, playing right now with all the white towels going up there in Happy Valley. So I'm picking, I'm taking Penn State uh, in the points on this one. Dun, 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 dun. Well, that's Seven Nation dun. Army now. Oh, yeah, that's... Uh... Oh, oh. Oh, oh yeah, 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 that's right. That's that's right. I, I got my, I got my little uh, chance mixed up. My, my entrance themes there, they're yeah. mixed up. Um, both of these teams have top three scoring defenses. Michigan, the number one defense in terms of yards per play. Penn State has the number two defense in terms of that. They, they get after the quarterback well in, in Happy Valley as well. Thirty-eight sacks on the season. That's second in the nation, but. Wayne, it's hard for me to go against this Michigan squad that's just absolutely dominated everybody amidst all the sign-stealing scandals. I can't remember which player it was, but he said, hey, if we're going to be the villains, we'll accept the role. So I think they're embracing this fully as a team, kind of understanding it's not on them, it's on the coaches, and uh, they still feel like they're one of the best teams in the country. Uh, This offensive line for Michigan has seven legitimate NFL prospects on it. I think they'll be able to handle the Nittany Lion pass rush. I'm going Michigan to cover. And again, we lost Larry. It's audio. He's going with Michigan to cover as well as TC. So let's go to our second game. Number 18, Utah. The Ute 7 and 2 come into Washington, the number five team in the country, 9 and 0. Utah is seven and two. Washington nine point favorites. The over under in this one's fifty four and a hook. Three thirty p.m. on Fox. Utah is a great secondary and a defensive line that will keep them in it till the very very light parts of the third fourth quarter, maybe even. But I think the offense for Washington will pull away, and the fact that Utah cannot throw the ball. If they get down 14 nothing, it'll be really tough for them to make this a game. But, again, this Husky offense is running on all cylinders right now. They're spreading the ball out. They have two receivers with over 50 catches. Um, Michael Penix Jr. So thrown for over 3,200 yards, 26 touchdowns, seven picks. And, again, when this, when this Husky offense is going, Wayne, it's, it, it's the – it's one of the best in the country, if not the best, depending on which which aspect you're looking at. And they got Polk on the outside. They got a Dunsey. Together, they got 15 touchdowns, and I think that'll be the difference in the end. Just too many playmakers for the Huskies. I see Washington covering this one. What say you? Uh, you know, Utah has messed me up too many times, uh, two in particular. So I'm picking Washington because I've picked them since the beginning of the year to be the top four. So I'm not going to change now. Uh, I'll take Washington to cover. Todd is going with Utah and the points on the road. And Larry is taking Washington as well. Our third game, the Tennessee Volunteers, seven and two, traveling to the 14th team in the country, the Missouri Tigers, also seven and two, a battle for second place in the SEC East. Tennessee, minus one and a half point favorites. Over under in this one, 58 and a hook, 3.30 p.m. on CBS. The key to this game will be, can Missouri stop Tennessee's run game? Tennessee comes into the, the uh, into this game third in the country, about 227 yards per game, a little north of that. So can Missouri stop that? Get back on offense and do what they do. Get the ball to Luther Burden and Schrader in the backfield. Um, but I, I, I do think that one loss to Georgia, giving them everything they could handle, will turn into a second loss. I think it'll be in the back of their head. I like Tennessee to control the clock in the second half, and they got a pretty good defense too. Give me the volunteers to cover on that note. Wayne, what say you? Well, yeah, I'm taking the volunteers to cover as well. Uh, I I just more confident in uh, Tennessee uh, being able to cover that point and a half than I am Missouri. Uh, you know, getting that close to winning. <laughs> yeah, it's it. This game's a real toss up to me. Missouri can can play with the best of them again. They have one of the best receivers in the country, and Luther Burden on the outside. They played extremely well to get after the quarterback. But 
Uh, it, it just, I, I think Tennessee's the better team. I think Hype will have them coached up and ready to play and get them saying, hey, we can still win this SEC East. All we got to do is beat Georgia, have Ole Miss beat Georgia, and boom, we're right back in the mix of things. So I think he's going to have that team mentality, and I think that that's going to be contagious. So I'm sticking with the volunteers there. Our fourth game of the evening, number nine, Ole Miss. Eight and one travels between the hedges to number two, Georgia. Nine and zero, oh, Georgia's ten and a half point favorites. Over under in this one's 58 and a half. Seven o'clock p.m. on ESPN, a night game in Athens. The first meeting between these teams, uh, but uh, excuse me, first meeting between these teams since 2016. Wayne, what say you? Uh, yeah, you know. The first half of these games, uh, Georgia usually looks like they're fixing to get beat, and then they come back and they just whomp the other team, and I expect nothing less than that here. Uh, Old Miss will keep it close or maybe even have the lead in the first half, but Georgia's going to come back and win the game. So I'm taking Georgia to cover, even though it's pretty big points. I like your pick, Wayne, and I'll tell you why. On third down, defensively, Georgia is one of the best teams in the country at getting off the field. They only allow teams to convert 26.6% of those attempts. And on the opposite side of that, Georgia's really good at converting third downs offensively, over 55% in that category. And the Rebels only convert 36.3% on third downs. I think that's a key. Another one's penalties. Seven point three penalties per game for Ole Miss. When you take it to the road, it's another penalty added on. They get over about eight a game. Georgia's crowd level is elite in these types of atmospheres. I think they'll be loud. There'll be a couple pre-start, uh, pre-snap penalties, and I think the Georgia crowd really factors into the game early. I think Georgia covers as well. Again, Georgia's defense not is not too shabby as well. They should be able to stop Judkins and Bentley from running all over them. Should be able to contain them. You can't stop them completely. His old misses of running games are really good. But again, Georgia covers. Todd is going old miss in the points, and Larry took Georgia to cover as well. Uh, that concludes our college games. Let's go to game five. Our first NFL game is the San Francisco 49ers at five and three travel to Jacksonville to take on the Jaguars. We're six and two. San Francisco is a road favorite at minus three over under. And that one's 44 and a half Sunday, one o'clock PM Eastern standard time on Fox. The 49ers are on a three game ro- uh, losing skid, excuse me. And in an offensive slump, they've scored 17 points in three straight games. I think Purdy spreads the ball around to his weapons. Ayuk, Samuel, Kittle, McCaffrey. I think Kyle Shanahan gets this team going offensively. And they work and they cook and they get a road win and end the losing skid at three. I like the Niners by a touchdown. Wayne, what say you? Man, this I, I got uh, two words for you. Duval. I'm taking the Jaguars at home on this one. I love that. They, they, that's their saying down there yeah. in, uh, in Jacksonville. Pretty cool. I think it's Duval County they, uh, yeah, they, they reside in, and, and uh, they, they, they represent it well down there. Yeah. Larry is taking the Jags and the points as well as TC. So I'm the Lone Ranger on the 49ers and Kyle Shanahan. Our sixth and final game of the day is a doozy. It's the Cleveland Browns coming in at five and three to Baltimore at seven and two. Baltimore six point favorites, which is rather large over under in this one's 38 and a half. 1 p.m. on Fox. Miles Garrett and this Browns defense is really elite, Wayne. I think that's the best overall from top to bottom right now in the NFL in terms of points per game. Uh, I know it's third at 17, but boy, they, they when they when they pin their ears back and get to the quarterback, they can do that. 27 sacks on the season. They can shut the run down, and I think that's exactly what they do. They'll bottle up that Ravens rushing attack, the number one in the NFL at over six, 160 yards per game. I think they'll, they'll spy 
Lamar Jackson, keep that extra linebacker in the box at all times, just following him around, forcing him to use his arm to beat him. And I think the DBs will make a play or two. I like the Browns and the points on this one. Uh, on the road, I think the Browns are pretty good. Deshaun Watson's healthy, and uh, Amari Cooper and him are seeming to get on that same page. So, Browns and the points for me. Wayne, what you got? Man, I'm taking the uh, B-round dog pound to beat the Ravens, even though I know Ravens at home is going to be pretty tough. Uh, six points? Yeah, I'll take those six points. <laughs> Larry's taken the Ravens to cover as well as TC. And that concludes our pick six. Guys, the standings as they are right now. Larry is at 28 and 32. He was four and two last week. TC's the last place at 26 and 34. He went three and three last week. Wayne, you were two and four last week, dropping you to 28 and 32, tied with Larry. And I had a bad week as well, went two and four dropping to 31 and 29 overall. Guys, let's get to our final thought. My final thought is more NFL head coaches need to take the Antonio Pierce approach. If you didn't hear, Pierce allowed his practice squad players to be on the sideline for the Sunday night win. Look, it's the best the Raiders looked all year, and I think it's great what he said after the game. Hey, they're part of the team. They give us a look on offense, defense, and special teams. They wear the Raiders, Raiders uniform. They show up. They work out. And he wants them to hopefully have that, as he called it, a carrot dangled in front of them to get to the NFL, to make that 53-man roster. I think more coaches should have that approach. Get your practice guys in the building. Wayne, what's your final thought? Well, you know, I was going to do something with Memphis basketball, but I have to let everybody know that uh, today, November 8th, is my mom's birthday. And so happy birthday, mom. Uh, hope you enjoyed the show. <laughs> yes. Happy birthday, Wayne's mom. Thanks for watching. Guys, that concludes our show. Sorry for the technical difficulties. For Todd Quarter and Larry Garner. Wayne in Memphis, I'm JJ Jurjevich. If you like the content, please like, subscribe, give us a reaction on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, and of course, Apple and Spotify. We'll see you next week, folks. Get you one. 